He knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. Earlier in this Modern Physics series, we touched upon some concepts in quantum mechanics in an introductory and strictly qualitative manner. For most people, this would be more than sufficient, because quantum mechanics is very difficult to understand, as it hinges entirely on the ability to apply fairly advanced principles of mathematics. But for those of us who wish to attain a more sophisticated understanding of this area of physics, we have no choice but to dive into the math, because quantum mechanics is math. Anyone who says otherwise either doesn't understand it or is trying to sell you something, often both. This rigorously mathematical approach will now be possible after having covered linear algebra at great length in my mathematics series, as well as some concepts regarding differential equations. If you're up to speed with these areas of math and you want to upgrade your understanding of quantum mechanics, the next handful of tutorials are going to be right up your alley. Together, we will derive the equations of quantum mechanics and try to understand what they tell us about quantum systems and, by extension, reality. If you are not up to speed on these areas of math, you have three options. The first option is to visit my mathematics playlist, scroll down and read the titles until you identify the limit of your current mathematical comprehension, and then proceed to view the playlist from that point forward in order, making sure to get through the topics we mentioned. The second option, if that sounds far too daunting, is to forego the mathematical prerequisites and watch these tutorials anyway. Rest assured, they will look and sound like complete gibberish, but you may still get something out of it, and I can't tell you how to live your life. Finally, the third option is to simply ignore these tutorials. Not everyone has to understand quantum mechanics, and in truth, only a minuscule percentage of people really do. It is far more important for non-physicists to understand Newtonian mechanics, electricity and magnetism, or other subfields of physics that are more readily applicable to our everyday experience. There are many tutorials in my Classical Physics series that cover these topics, and I highly recommend them if you are interested in learning aspects of physics that are a bit more tangible and comprehensible. However, if you find yourself overwhelmed with curiosity regarding the quantum world, limiting ourselves to only a qualitative discussion does a deep disservice to the field, so these next few tutorials will be here for anyone that wants to take it upon themselves to do the heavy lifting and really dig into the math. The end result will be a healthy deconstruction of a field of science that has been overloaded with mysticism by popular media, which never bodes well for public science literacy. So if you've decided you're on board the quantum train, let's get started. To begin, let's quickly reiterate a key distinction that must be made when considering classical systems versus quantum systems. When we model the behavior of classical systems of particles, we usually ask questions like, where is some particle located? Where will it be some specific time from now? How fast is it going? These are questions we asked and answered in the classical physics series when examining Newtonian mechanics as it applies to macroscopic objects and events, such as when throwing a ball. In such cases, we would define the position of the object with the variable x. After learning the basics of differential calculus, velocity can be regarded as the derivative of position with respect to time, or v equals dx over dt, and acceleration as the derivative of velocity with respect to time, or a equals dv over dt. We can discuss the momentum of that object using p equals mv, where momentum equals mass times velocity. From here, Newton's famous equation f equals ma describes the acceleration exhibited by an object as a function of the force applied upon it, which will be inversely proportional to its mass. This equation could be used to predict the precise position and velocity of a classical particle at any time, provided that we know the initial conditions. This relationship between force and acceleration is so powerful that we still use it in lots of complicated calculations today, and if we want to know any of these dynamical variables for a classical particle or system, we can take our cameras or whatever apparatus we are using to take measurements and rigidly determine both the position x and momentum p simultaneously, such that we can write their values down and use them to do calculations. And there it is. That's classical mechanics in a nutshell. 
However, as we touched upon in previous tutorials, quantum particles, or the teeny tiny particles that are smaller than an atom, operate under a different set of rules. We don't have quantum cameras or any other such measuring device that can examine a quantum particle such as an electron and give us a number for both x and p simultaneously. Instead, all measurements must satisfy the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which in the case of the complementary variables position and momentum is written as delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to h bar over 2, where h bar is the reduced Planck constant equal to h over 2 pi, making this term as a whole equal to h over 4 pi. What this means is that we can't know both the position and momentum of such a particle simultaneously with supreme precision. There must be some uncertainty associated with one or both parameters, and the more certain one is, the more uncertain the other becomes. So why is this the case? Why does such a limit exist? Why is this the way we must approach the description of quantum systems? The way we approached this question when we were coming at it from a conceptual standpoint was to talk about wave-particle duality. A quantum particle, like an electron, is not just a particle, it is also a wave. If it were to possess both a discrete position and momentum simultaneously, it could be regarded exclusively as a particle. But it is not just a particle, so it does not possess precise values for these parameters at once. It simply is not in its nature. But we have gone over this before. Now to enhance our understanding, what is the reasoning from a purely mathematical standpoint? Well, to start, in quantum mechanics, position and momentum are not just numbers, they are linear operators. Operators are mathematical objects that act upon functions and result in the production of other functions as an output, similar to the way that functions act upon values to produce other values. Operators must satisfy the following two properties. First, operator A acting on the product of the constant A and the function f of x equals the constant A times the operator A acting on the function f of x. Second, operator A acting on the sum of functions f of x and g of x equals operator A acting on f of x plus operator A acting on g of x. We learned about these relationships in the linear algebra portion of the mathematics series, where we saw that linear operators can act on matrices to produce other matrices. This is exactly what we are dealing with here. But why do we use operators when we deal with quantum particles, and why don't we use them when we deal with classical particles? The reason is that classical particles are macroscopic objects, meaning that they are much larger than an atom. When you do the math for a classical object in motion, its properties, such as position and momentum, have well-defined values that you can measure. We can say that some particle is at this position and it has this momentum. As we mentioned, quantum particles don't behave like this. They are in several places at the same time, at all times, and we need to represent this mathematically somehow. That's why we have the wave function, which is a mathematical description of an isolated quantum system, given by the Greek letter psi. This gives us an idea of the distributed presence of a quantum particle. It describes the state of the particle as a superposition of all possible states. In other words, it is the mathematical description of the physical reality of the particle being in several places at the same time, before measurement, and its absolute value squared represents a probability distribution function. To be as formal as possible, the probability distribution function, p of x, equals the product psi conjugate times psi, which equals the modulus squared of psi of x, where the term modulus refers to the square root of a complex number z times its complex conjugate z star. In case we are rusty with our complex numbers, recall that they always have a real part and an imaginary part, the latter of which includes i which represents the square root of negative one. And if we are dealing with a complex wave function, which normally describe oscillating systems, it is difficult to interpret psi of x as a real or physical quantity. That is why we utilize the complex conjugate, which is the same expression, but with the sign of the imaginary part reversed. When we multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, we always get a real result, because we end up with an i-squared term, which simplifies to negative 1. 
The same concept applies here. If we take psi conjugate times psi, we necessarily get a real number, which can tell us something about physical reality. So essentially, the squared magnitude of the wave function is the probability density function that helps us find where we have a chance of measuring the particle, which is the kind of math that was done to determine the shapes of the atomic orbitals that electrons inhabit within an atom, which we learned about in the general chemistry series. Getting back to the question at hand, because we have to represent quantum objects with the wave function, we need operators that can act on the wave function to retrieve information encoded within, and can provide answers in the form of measurements. Later, we will expand considerably on what a wave function is. For now, let's talk about how the actions of operators on wave functions can give us information about quantum objects. Mathematically, if we have a function psi of x, when an operator a acts upon it, we get another function, phi of x. Again, this is precisely the way that when a function f acts on a quantity x, we get another quantity y, except that operators act on functions. Here are some examples of operators to help make this concept perfectly clear. For this first one, operator 1 on psi equals the partial derivative of psi with respect to time. Next, operator 2 on psi equals x times the partial derivative of psi with respect to x. And lastly, operator 3 on psi equals alpha times psi, where alpha is a constant. Now let's try applying these operators to a specific function, such as the following wave function, psi of x and t equals the complex exponential of kx minus omega t. If you are familiar with the physics of oscillations, we usually refer to this type of wave as a plane wave, because the wave front, which refers to the spatial distribution of, for instance, light, is flat. In this equation, k is the wave vector 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is wavelength. The wave vector describes the spatial frequency of the wave. In other words, it tells us how many peaks and valleys the wave has over a certain length. Then x is the position, and omega is the angular frequency, equal to 2 pi nu, where nu is the frequency of the wave. Now let's apply the three operators we listed previously. The first operator takes the partial derivative of psi with respect to time. If this seems daunting, you may need to refresh your memory regarding partial derivatives, as well as the chain rule for differentiation, and in particular how it applies to functions resembling e to the x. But if this is familiar to you, then recall that d over dt means that t is the variable. The other parameters will be treated as constants, and realizing that i distributes across this parenthetical, it is negative i times omega that will be pulled down in front of the term. And since the term equivalent to psi is unchanged, we can report this as negative i omega psi. The second operator is x times the partial derivative of psi with respect to x. This time, it is i k that will be pulled down in front of the term when differentiating, leaving us with i k x psi. And finally, the third operator just multiplies psi by the constant alpha, so we end up with alpha psi. So now we know how to apply operators to functions. Now, as we said, in quantum mechanics, position and momentum are operators. The position operator in one dimension can be written thusly, as the position operator x, psi of x, equals x times psi of x, where x is the eigenvalue of the operator x acting on psi of x. We talked about eigenvalues and eigenvectors at great length in one of the linear algebra tutorials, and it is quite important to understand what these are, so visit that tutorial if you need a refresher on this terminology. Also be sure to notice the difference in notation between the operator x and the variable x, as these mean different things. The momentum operator is a bit more complicated. Here, the momentum operator p, acting on psi of x, equals negative i times h bar times the partial derivative of psi of x with respect to x. 
We use a partial derivative here for two reasons. First, the wave function, as we will see later, also depends on time, which means we should actually write it as psi of x and t. The second reason is that it is defined in three dimensions, where the complete form could be written as psi of x, y, z, and t. Therefore, if we want to study the dynamics of a quantum particle in three dimensions, we'll need these three operators. These are the momentum operator in x, in y, and in z, each containing a partial derivative with respect to that particular variable. These equations display the orthogonal components of a three-dimensional system. However, for the time being, we will focus only on one-dimensional problems. Now, we easily identified the eigenvalue of the position operator, but it's not so obvious in these expressions for the momentum operator. To find an intuitive answer, we can apply what is referred to as the de Broglie principle and write our quantum object in its waveform, psi equals this expression, where again, k is the wave vector, omega is frequency, and t is time. If we now apply the momentum operator, we see that negative i h bar goes out front, and then we take the partial derivative of psi with respect to x. Since we have i k x in the exponent, i k must come down in front of the complex exponential, and the rest remains the same. The two versions of i with opposing sign cancel one another out, because negative i squared equals 1. And we can express this section simply as psi again, which means we get h bar times k times psi. Therefore, we see that the eigenvalue of the momentum operator for the wave function we chose is h bar times k. This is actually another way of expressing the de Broglie relation, and it will be worth our while to derive this result starting from here as well. The relation states that lambda equals h over p, where lambda is wavelength, h is the Planck constant, and p is momentum. We can rearrange to get p equals h over lambda. Then let's take the definition of the wave vector, k equals 2 pi over lambda, and rearrange to solve for lambda, which is 2 pi over k. Plugging this in for lambda in the other expression, we get p equals h over the quantity 2 pi over k. And simplifying gives us h k over 2 pi. We know that h over 2 pi can be expressed as h bar, so we are left with p equals h bar times k, just as we found through the previous method. Now let's pause for a moment. We will come back to these two important operators a bit later. First, it will be a good idea to define some important operator properties such that we can apply them to operators found in quantum mechanics. Some basic rules to know when dealing with operators are as follows. 1. Operators can be defined as the sum of other operators. For example, s equals a plus b. What this means is that the action of s on psi is equal to the action of a on psi plus the action of b on psi. 2. If an operator contains constants or complex numbers, these remain constants. So with c, which equals beta times b, where beta is a complex number, beta remains a constant when the operator acts on a function. So applying c to psi, we get beta times the action of b on psi. 3. Operators that represent what we refer to as observables are Hermitian, or self-adjoint. This is the fancy name for operators whose eigenvalues are real numbers. Position and momentum are Hermitian operators, because any measurement of these parameters must be a real number, and it makes sense intuitively that we would refer to position and momentum as observables. Mathematically, we can easily identify a Hermitian operator if it is equal to its own complex conjugate, a relationship which is represented symbolically as A equals A dagger. We talked about Hermitian matrices in a linear algebra tutorial, so head over there if this seems a bit fuzzy. Otherwise, just recall that if an operator is in matrix form, the complex conjugate involves getting the complex matrix, represented by a star, and then transposing it, represented with a T, and these two operations combined are represented by the dagger symbol. And finally, four. Operators generally do not commute. 
This means that AB is not necessarily equal to BA. Therefore, the order of operators must be followed strictly. If you encounter an operator M, which equals AB, if this operator is to act on psi, one should operate such that M acting on psi will be equal to A acting on the result of B acting on psi. So B must act first. Now let's quickly apply these rules to understand a couple more key points. First, let's examine the notion of the power of an operator. Say we square the position operator x and allow that to act upon psi. If we apply the rule we just learned, we get this parenthetical term. So first we get x times psi, and then the x operator acts again to give us another x, and we are left with x squared psi. This will be important later when we get a closer look at the Schrodinger equation. And finally, we must mention a very important operator in quantum mechanics, the commutator. We write the commutator of two operators, A and B, by putting them inside square brackets like this. And when the commutator acts on operators A and B, it will give us A acting on B minus B acting on A. Recall that since operators generally do not commute, AB is not the same as BA, and therefore the commutator typically will not equal zero. It will only equal zero in the special case that the operators A and B happen to commute in that particular case. This operator can act on some function just like any other operator, which means the action of the commutator on psi equals A acting on B acting on psi minus B acting on A acting on psi. To make sure we understand, let's produce the commutator for the two operators we have discussed so far, position and momentum, using position in place of A and momentum in place of B. Then let's have this commutator act on the only wave function we've used so far. As we would expect, the action of the commutator of position and momentum acting on psi equals x acting on p acting on psi minus p acting on x, acting on psi. Now to make things a little easier on ourselves, let's first just recall what happens when p and x individually act on the wave function. When x acts on psi, we get x times psi. When p acts on psi, we get negative i times h bar times the partial derivative of psi with respect to x. Now we can apply these definitions to the expression we have now one term at a time. In the first term, x acting on p acting on psi, the momentum operator must act first, since that involves taking the partial derivative with respect to x, and i and k act as constants on x, we bring those down in front. Then combining that with the negative i and the h bar, these two multiply to give us one, leaving us with h bar times k times psi. Now x must act upon this, which just involves multiplying by x, so the whole first term of the commutator will be x h bar k psi. Now the second term of the commutator, p acting on x acting on psi, is a little trickier, so let's compute that separately. As you can see, first x must act on psi. That gives us x times psi. Now p must act on the quantity x times psi, so we have negative i times h bar times the partial derivative of x times psi with respect to x. This time we must use the product rule for differentiation, which we are familiar with from our study of calculus, given that each term in this product contains x. This will be the derivative of the first term times the second term plus the first term times the derivative of the second term. The derivative of the first term, x, is simply 1, so that leaves us with just the second term, psi. Then we have the first term, x, times the derivative of the second term with respect to x, which brings i and k down here to give i k psi. So that's i k x psi altogether. Now let's distribute negative i h bar across this sum to get negative i h bar psi plus h bar k x psi. 
Now remember, this whole expression is the second term in the commutator, which must be subtracted from the first. So let's put it in parentheses so that we don't make any careless errors with sign. And we see that these two terms cancel, leaving us with i h-bar psi. So what we are left with is the realization that the commutator of position and momentum equals i times h-bar. This is the fundamental commutation relation between position and momentum. This relation, which is at the core of quantum mechanics, is actually the source of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We can see that position and momentum are conjugate operators, and they do not commute. Whenever we encounter non-commuting operators, we will find a limit on the precision with which we can simultaneously measure the physical quantities they represent, the implications of which we discussed earlier in this modern physics series. So with that, we understand the concept of an operator, some basic rules for applying operators, and how to apply the position and momentum operators to the wave function. Now it's time to learn more about the wave function, so let's move forward and do just that. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.